So out of all of the Buddha's qualities, uh, it is this quality which he most um, kind of, um, the Buddha most represents for him, he who is so kind. Uh, so welcome. Uh, so last week, we, or last weekend, we celebrated a Buddhist festival, uh, Paranirvana Day, uh, the festival of the Buddha's uh, final liberation. And it particularly a festival which marks or even celebrates his uh, death, his passing away. And uh, yeah, in uh, the Buddhist world, that is um, uh, not, not necessarily a sombre episode, but a uh, festival of uh, remembrance and also reflection on the nature of impermanence. So uh, my name is Virinaga. I'm here with my uh, friend Amra Pushpa. Um, uh, I'm going to tell you uh, the story of the Buddha's Paranirvana and then we're going to have a little discussion uh, around some of the themes which uh, that, uh, that comes out of that episode. So um, uh, I will very, very briefly touch on a little bit of the Buddha's life for those of you that aren't aware of the, the Buddha, but obviously I can't dwell very long in 10 minutes. Uh, but just to say that uh, the Buddha was born a wealthy man who decided to go forth uh, or leave his uh, previous life and go forth into the spiritual life to uh, discover the truth, as he put it, discover the truth. And uh, after um, uh, seeing what was out there, uh, realizing the limitations of that, he then realized his own uh, path to liberation, his path to freedom from uh, suffering. And uh, he's said to have achieved enlightenment around the age of 35 uh, and then spent the, the next uh, 40 to 45 years uh, teaching the Dharma, teaching the path to liberation. And where we pick up the story now, uh, the Buddha has, uh, has taught for these uh, four decades or more. And he uh, yeah, is approaching his, well, he's approaching his final days, uh, his final day. And uh, so as it happens, um, uh, yeah, he's been uh, on a final, he's, he realizes his time is nearly up and embarks on a final teaching tour uh, to go and uh, spread his Dharma. And by this time, he's got a huge uh, following of disciples. He's uh, ordained uh, thousands of uh, monastics and monks, uh, bhikkhus, as they were called then. And uh, yeah, as the, there's, he's um, led lots of uh, others to enlightenment as well. Um, but he, he's traveling with his uh, cousin and attendant, uh, Ananda, uh, who's been with him for, uh, well, many, many years. And um, uh, yeah, it's clear that the Buddha is uh, getting uh, frail. And I should just say that this is uh, all set in, uh, in Northeast India. So uh, the Buddha would have uh, been born in Northeast India um, uh, and uh, yeah, pro wandered f fairly widely around that region for much of his life. But of course, much of the travel, almost all of the travel was on foot. So uh, certainly not a, uh, certainly couldn't get, get around in the same way as we can today. But yeah, so he, would, uh, he was traveling with his cousin Ananda, and there's a little passage I just want to read you, which I think illustrates his kind of, um, uh, kind of state very well. He says to Ananda, uh, I am now old, worn out. I've reached my term of life. I'm turning 80 years old. And just as an old cart is made to go by being held together by straps, so the Tathagata's body is kept going by being bandaged up. So although he's this, uh, he has this uh, mind of the enlightened uh, person or the enlightened being, he, his body is uh, still a human body. So it's, uh, he's not free of the suffering of old age or sickness. And uh, yeah, he can't in a certain way avoid the death of his body. As it, uh, as it wears out from, uh, well, age and all the years of uh, walking from place to place to teach the Dharma. So, um, I mean, there's a very interesting theme that we might be able to pick up later here in that, you know, you imagine that the Buddha's mind is not troubled by that in the same way that we might moan or complain about our aching knees or our bad back or our elbows or whatever. Um, but, um, you know, his mind is free of that, yet he still experiences the physical discomfort, the physical pain uh, of the body, of the body. Um, 
So yeah, I'll explain the significance of that in, in due course. Um, so yes, he embarks on this uh, final teaching tour, and particularly um, Arlander is asking about whether, well, who should succeed the Buddha in a way, who should become the head of the Sangha. Uh, and the Buddha during this time says, uh, well, basically, he, he, I, I, I won't read the whole, the whole passages, it's fairly large, but he basically um, says that there shouldn't be a successor, that he uh, hasn't held back any uh, Dharma teachings, he's taught uh, everything in a certain way that he can. And uh, the, what the, uh, the bhikkhus need to do, or what the practitioners and followers need to do, is just uh, follow the Dharma, follow the teachings. And if they follow these teachings, uh, they will have everything they need to uh, attain their own liberation, uh, their own liberation from suffering. So he, he very much lays out the Dharma as his uh, kind of successor in a way. Um, so uh, as, he's, as he's on this teaching tour, he, um, he, uh, you know, he would often uh, be uh, hosted uh, by uh, whoever's in the region and uh, you know, having the Buddha to dinner, you can imagine, would be a great uh, privilege. And there's particularly um, a, uh, a, well, uh, he meets a, a man, a blacksmith actually called Kunda, and he uh, offers him, offers the Buddha uh, a meal, as is often done. But this uh, meal uh, makes the Buddha sick. He, uh, it's thought that he has some type of food poisoning or uh, there's some, uh, the food is tainted in some way. And the Buddha becomes very uh, ill and, uh, yes, yeah, sick. Uh, because of this food. And the first thing the Buddha cares about is uh, that Kunda doesn't take this uh, personally in a way. He doesn't feel that somehow he's, um, uh, you know, um, uh, like, like um, yeah, will poison the Buddha in a way. Uh, so he's, he's very concerned that um, uh, Kunda doesn't uh, feel as though it's his um, fault in a way and sends Anand back to reassure Kunda that it's uh, of great merit to give the uh, to target her, as he's called, the, his uh, final meal. So that's his first concern. And he, he travels on, he's able to uh, continue traveling for a little while, and, uh, and then he, f he reaches a point uh, at uh, uh, Kus uh, Kusanagar. And um, in India now, there's a great monument there to the Buddha, but he, he gets as far as that, and then he's too weak to travel. And Ananda uh, um, uh, sort of sets him up a resting place on a sort of stone bench uh, uh, that's uh, flanked by these, uh, what's called uh, two uh, sala trees. And um, uh, so the Buddha, the Buddha rests there. And Ananda, his uh, companion, um, uh, obviously uh, recognizes here that the Buddha is um, how the Buddha is dying and he sort of um, he sort of takes himself off and has a moment where he um, kind of well realizes what's what's happening and um, he you know he's particularly well, he's, he's beside himself at this that the, the that the Buddha could pass away and obviously he doesn't want the Buddha to die he doesn't want uh, to be left without the Buddha. And he, uh, he has a famous ex exclamation he makes, uh, is that, oh, he who is so kind, so out of all of the Buddha's qualities, uh, it is this quality which he most um, kind of, um, the Buddha most represents for him, he who is so kind. Uh, so not the Buddha's wisdom or his uh, enlightenment or whatever, his teaching prowess, uh, whatever, it's he who is so kind. So I'm having, you know, having to skip over a lot of the, the details here, but I'd really recommend you reading a bit more about it if you're interested, uh, but I'll press on. And uh, so the word goes out that the Buddha is dying and uh, the Sangha, everyone that can, within a day or two's travel that uh, uh, is part of the Sangha or the community comes uh, together and uh, comes to gather around the Buddha to uh, witness his passing away. And there's, um, there's one uh, particularly insistent um, young man who wants to be uh, ordained by the Buddha. And so the Buddha conducts one last ordination into the bhikkhu sangha. And uh, this, uh, this particular bhikkhu is called uh, Supada. And, um, he, and then he, he um, reminds the monks that he uh, wants them to treat the Dharma as the teacher. So you kind of get the sense that even now he's thinking very much about the future of the Sangha and uh, how uh, the, the bhikkhus and the, the, the spiritual practitioners, the lay practitioners can continue to, to practice. And he, I think he recognizes in this that he, um, 
you know, uh, uh, well, he, he, if another leader comes along, another teacher, uh, that that kind of positive uh, kind of pursuit of the Dharma could get watered down or confused. So he very much entreats uh, his uh, spiritual community to, uh, yeah, practice the Dharma, worship the Dharma, uh, worship the teachings. And then he asks if there's any final questions. And um, uh, apparently there's silence. And he, 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 he keeps on asking a few more times. He says, no, come now, bhikkhus. Uh, like, do, you know, basically, do let me know if there's anything that's not been clear. Have I not, have I not taught you everything you need to know uh, about the Dharma? Do speak up if you're at all confused. And uh, again, there's no answer. And then one final time, he, says, he even says, well, if you're too afraid to ask or too embarrassed to ask or too shy to ask, well, ask a friend to ask for you. Uh, so do, you know, he just wants it to be really clear, uh, his, his teaching, the, the teaching that he leaves uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the bhikkhus, with the spiritual community. And again, no one says uh, anything. So the, the Buddha's um, final words, uh, he then gives his final words, um, which is, uh, well, um, it's often translated, you often hear it uh, translated as, um, all conditioned things are impermanent, with mindfulness strive on. All conditioned things are impermanent, with mindfulness strive on. Now that might not be the most literal translation in a way, but it's definitely one of the most uh, poetic and maybe um, evocative. Um, another rendering of it would be something like, uh, all phenomenon by nature decay and die. It is through vigilance that you succeed in awakening. All phenomena by their nature decay and die. It is through vigilance that you succeed in awakening. So he's basically there entreating his uh, well, spiritual community to continue to practice mindfulness, vigilance, uh, skillfulness. And with that, he enters a deep uh, meditation and, uh, and yeah, pa passes away, passes away. But um, yeah, we talk about the Buddha's paranirvana, so uh, you know his final liberation, or reaching uh, his final nirvana. And um, yeah, I think you know Buddhism very much recognises that uh, you know death is not the end in a way. Um, it also wouldn't uh, well, it wouldn't subscribe to a kind of materialist view that once your body dies and your brain dies. Uh, you know, everything is gone in a way. There's just a, a black abyss of nothing. Um, it, you know, also very much doesn't subscribe to the idea that there is somehow a, a, an immortal soul that sort of pops out of one body and gets uh, kind of reincarnated in another body. Um, Buddhism, um, you know, Buddhism definitely teaches that, uh, you know, um, uh, things uh, continue on, uh, you know, uh, things which co uh, things cause other things, and there's a constant flow of change and transition. Uh, what that means for the nature of our, our very own uh, existence and our very own uh, consciousness and awareness, it's, it's hard to say. I certainly don't have experience of that uh, personally, or certainly not experience I can remember. Uh, but definitely, um, uh, uh, increasingly, as I've, um, well, uh, as I've practiced more and more, uh, I, I found myself um, becoming more and more convinced of the, uh, well, that uh, there's, there's something of a mystery there. And so with the Buddha, um, you have much the same. So you have this final release from the suffering of the body, uh, the old and worn out body of the Buddha, uh, a release into something uh, else. And what that something else is, is uh, something uh, of a mystery. So thank, thank you, Virinaga. Hey. I'm always moved to hear about the Buddha's final days. And mm. you've touched on, you know, there's so much to say about it, but, mm. um, you know, you touched on this mystery, not only the mystery of what happens after death, but the mystery of what happens to an enlightened being mm. when this physical body dies. Mm. Um, and it's sometimes described as uh, enlightenment without remainder. Mm. <laughs> And that when his body passes away, there's nothing else connecting him with a world where things rise and fall away that are subject to mm. impermanence. Mm. And in fact, he described enlightenment as a deathless state, mm. which I always find very intriguing. Mm. Mm. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Because traditionally you have the sense of, you know, um, 
people practitioner, uh, practitioners kind of working on their uh, kind of enlightenment over lifetimes in a way yes. or, or different kind of manifestations and yeah the idea that that kind of repeating is some is sort of undesirable because of the yes. inherent suffering that is in or birth and death and life in a way and so the kind of um, the, in a certain way one of the goals is to not kind of repeat that uh, one of the goals of Buddhism in a way um, do you mean by rebirth yeah, yeah. that's right yeah um, but it's quite interesting, isn't it, thinking about, because um, from our, I guess, from our kind of cultural position, it feels a bit like, well, that's, uh, well, death is thought of as quite a scary thing, isn't it? Yes. You know, or somehow, yeah. why would you want to sort of die and never come back or, yes, you know, yes. um, so I just find that very interesting. I don't know if you've got any sort of reflections on that being both a Buddhist practitioner and also uh, or a cultural Westerner in a way. Yeah, you know, um, yeah. It's, it's very intriguing, the whole idea of rebirth. Um, when I first came across it, I just thought it was so bizarre mm. and strange. It just does feel very Ill, still a bit. And yet when I think about it, it makes complete <coughs> sense. Mm. And of course, the Buddha saw all his previous lifetimes as part of his enlightenment experience. And I have complete faith in the Buddha. <laughs> mm. And uh, But on the other hand, as a, as a Westerner, um, and kind of love of life that can come with our outlook yeah. um, and death is bad. You know, I remember, you know, my mother always saying how bad death was and that was like the worst thing. Yeah. And um, that, yeah, why wouldn't I want to have another life? Even, even though, you know, as one Buddhist teacher says, it all ends in tears yeah. and a certain, it all comes to an end. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And we often live life without that truth in mind mm. so we're often unprepared mm. for mm. that great transition which is what it is because mm. um, whatever happens things mm. don't come to an abrupt end because conditions are rising and falling and continuing in their own way mm. um, with energies with matter you know mm. all these different levels mm. so um, yeah, it's, um, it, it makes me think, too, if we take this truth in, um, we, we live life better. Yes. And, yeah. and I think that what's so moving about the story of the Buddha's three months before he dies, which is the most detailed in the Pali Canon, is how well he's an exemplar of how to prepare for death. Mm. You know, he gave him three months notice, I'm mm. going to die. He went around to all these towns, all the people he'd had in contact mm. with, and very generously offered last teachings. He mm. thought about what would happen with his body after he died, mm. so he left very specific instructions, mm. and it was a very positive, mm. um, very beautiful way, mm. um, you know, even if he was an enlightened being. Mm. Um, to die, mm. yeah. I, I, yeah, I very much like that point that you're making there because of course our culture or our society tends to like to hide death, doesn't it? Or yes. tends to ignore it in a yes. way. I mean, I just think about when, you know, my grandfather died in a way. He was taken off into hospital. You know, I didn't see him in hospital. He came mm. out in a kind of casket, you know, and then he was taken to the crematorium. I didn't see the body at all. Yes. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I just saw sort of a wooden box and that was yes. somehow my grandfather in a way so it's all kind of a bit removed isn't it and yes. when we have to deal with it it's a little bit hidden uh, right. in a way uh, it's sort of interesting you know at the moment we're well you know we're in a pandemic and we've been in a pandemic for a year or more now and I wonder if there's a lot of people have talked about what a crazy year it's been and mm. I slightly wonder whether some of that is just that people have been confronted a bit more with mortality that, we, yes, that we, could be. That yeah. could be. And I, and I think we, we, we spend a lot of energy avoiding that truth. Mm. You know, there's a lot of emphasis on living well, getting the most pleasure you can, mm. and the best holidays, and you know, all that's kind of falling, falling to the side. Mm. And, and there's a lot of association of death of being separated mm. from those pleasures and, mm. and, and people you love. Mm. Um, but what I love about Paranirvana Day, mm. you know, we had a celebration on Sunday, mm. is, is people bring to mind loved ones that have died over the years, and we all hear about it as a community. Mm. And so, 
you get this sense of common humanity, but also a, a celebration of their qualities. Mm. And uh, for a day after that, I mean, you know, people in my life who had passed away, um, I had a real sense of their beautiful qualities mm. and the sense that things don't end at death, that there's, there's still a continu continuation of that connection and, mm. and those qualities. Mm. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's not that cut and dried, it's the end. Mm. Um, and, but I think Ananda very beautifully, that very human friendship he mm. had with the Buddha mm. also brings in, yes, of, of course we're going to be bereft, to be what seems to be separated mm. from uh, loved ones mm. is, 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 a, is a very sad aspect mm. of mm. the fact that everything, comes, everything, everything that comes into being also fades. Mm. And, uh, mm. It's that cycle. Mm. Well, yeah, no, that's, I was actually going to ask you what you kind of thought the benefits of um, reflecting on, in a certain way, the Buddha's death and people, the death of people we know in a way, and, you know, yeah. the celebration of Paranirvana Day. You know, I think you brought that up kind of very nicely in a way, mm. making it more alive. Yes. Because, of course, once someone has died, they're not sort of gone, are they? They're, no. they're in our in our minds, in our imagination, in our memories, their actions continue on. I mean, That's the right. Buddha's actions, we, here we are today, right. practicing the Dharma, which yes. of course is in a certain way the Buddha's legacy. That's right. And, um, you know, there's a slight kind of, uh, you know, I can hear that, oh, but that's somehow there's a sense of, some people can think that that's not real in a way, but mm. of course it's just as real as anything we experience, That's isn't it? Right. You know, a memory right. of a loved one or a, a reflection of on them or their qualities. It's, you know, bringing them to mind is just the, uh, well, the s similar as if we were in the room with them in a way. You know, it's just as real in our experience. It can be, yes, mm. it can be, um, definitely. Our, our experience, you know, because we imagine all sorts of things that aren't real, you know, like having arguments in our head with somebody. Mm. Um, why can't we also, um, you know, have that sense of con con continuity with mm. someone who's, you know, it's our choice, you know, I think um, I've, um, yeah, I've really cultivated that and it, it really um, deepens the meaning of life mm. and, um, yeah, and, and hearing those names and the relationships with different people in the community on, on Sunday, it, um, I was also thinking of all the effects each person who died had on, on other people who mm. knew them. Mm. And then it's, it's just this real sense of metta and the fact that sometimes people think you can't, you know, send metta to people who have died, but mm. it's, it's just as... Mm. It's just as valid as for people who are living. There isn't mm. that that kind of s separation. You mm. know, it's just bringing that um, all those good qualities stay staying alive in us. Mm. You know? mm. I mean, I feel like we should also, you know, there's a we can talk about it intellectually and rationally, but I also very much feel like I want to leave the door open to mystery in a way. Like yes. we don't yes. know what happens after death, no. do we? And no. for all we, you know, there, uh, you know, there's these maybe. You know, there's these other planes of existence, other planes of That's reality right. that are completely viable, completely yes. possible, yes. you know, like yes. the idea that we die and it's a big black nothingness is just a, yes. it's just a theory, much the same as there's a, an afterlife of some, of some well, it's, kind. It's, it's as you said, it's a very materialistic view of mm. things, that the only thing that exists is matter, mm. um, which, which isn't scientifically true anyway, mm. you know, it's not borne out. But that's, that's kind of where we're, you know, our attention is coaxed more in, in those mm. lines. Um, mm. So, yeah, this whole, um, it makes me think of one wonderful stories about the Buddha's death, which is quite mythological, is he, he asked um, some monks to stand aside because there were gods or beings mm. in another realm who were trying to get a view of the Buddha. And, these monks were blocking their view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I just feel I want those elements in my yes. in my life in a way. I want to I want to leave those the door open to yes. uh, to those well realms and gods and goddesses and yes. you know also well, who knows what happens in a way. Yes. Who knows what happens? And um, you know what the Buddha says about you know when he was asked. Or th this was the burning question often when he was teaching what happens to an enlightened one after they die. And he's, well, he said it's not really in any, you can't really put in any conceptual realm that mm. we could understand because mm. it's, it's beyond this kind of conditioned way mm. of looking 
at things. And mm. you know, he said it's not true to say I continue to exist. It's not mm. true to say I continue not to exist. Mm. It's not true, you know, that I exist and not exist. You know, mm. both. Uh, so it is that mystery. Mm. Um, and he uses the word deathless, mm. which I find really intriguing mm. and mysterious. Mm. Um, I mean, I've often wondered whether it's related to the, you know, there's something here around, you know. Um, uh, uh, our, our sort of our identity not being fixed and separate. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. if, you know, if it is, you know, if there's, if we're not kind of fixed and separate, there's sort of nothing to die in a way. Exactly. Uh, not exactly. an individual self to die. That's right. So of course the idea about death or birth becomes somehow, yes. um, well, kind of irrational, the wrong type of that's right. phrasing in a way. Um, I mean, I don't know that, but that's what I often think about in a way that to be entirely, to have my sense of self-identity so weakened that I um, am part of something much larger. Well, yes. what could die? That's in a right. Way, that's right. Know. It's And it's the body just going through that that cycle of rising and falling and mm. and transforming continual change into something else. But in terms of a me, Mm. that dies, that, that, that drops away. Mm. And so does a sense of time and space. Mm. So for things to die, it needs this kind of rigid concept of time. Mm. Um, so that, that again is that kind of materialistic cutoff and calibrating in time, mm. everything, everything in our experience, mm. which, isn't, uh, which isn't the true nature of things mm. when we really think deeply. Mm about it mm. you know. well even in our physics experiments and so That's on right. aren't they you know yes. time is a is a fluid uh, thing which yes. doesn't pass uh it's kind of objectively you know mm. 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 yeah so much uh, so much of what the buddha said about you know the nature of reality is so in line with you know the modern, mm. modern scientific, scientific understanding studies yeah, yeah. Mm. well we've gone from the buddha to <laughs> yeah. the mystery to science yes. Um, mm. So maybe we should wrap up there. Yes. Um, yeah, but thanks. That's very good. And, you know, I continue to appreciate um, Paranirvana Day as a festival. Yes. So nice to be here with you to talk Me about too. it. Me yeah. too. I just, um, sorry, I just say one last thing yeah. about the image. If it comes across, it's, it's the image of the Buddha, classic Paranirvana mm. pose, which is known as the lion pose. Mm. Um, so he's on his side and you can't see the full image, but he has one foot lying on top of the other. Mm. And uh, yeah. So, and white is often uh, the color of, of death mm. in, uh, you know, used for Paranirvana Day. Mm. Yeah. Great. So I hope you enjoyed that uh, Dharma Night talk. Uh, so if you did enjoy it, if you're enjoying our videos, I just want to ask you or encourage you to think about making a donation to the Brixton Buddhist community. Uh, we're a UK charity that relies completely on your donations to uh, run everything here. And uh, yeah, if you, this was a class, a meditation class, there'd be a donation bowl that you could just put in £10 at the end of the night uh, to help support the activities. But as you're watching this online, uh, well, I just want to th ask you to think about making an online donation. If you've watched uh, four or five videos this month, uh, maybe you might want to think about giving uh, £10. Uh, so there's a link in the description below where you can go to our website and make a donation. And if you don't want to, if you want to keep giving, you don't want to worry about uh, making that donation every month, well, you could just set us up a standing order, a monthly standing order. Uh, that would be really, really helpful. Uh, yeah, I want to suggest something of the region of maybe 10 or 20 pounds a month. Uh, if you're uh, able to do that. And that would be really, really helpful and help us keep producing videos like this one. Thanks for listening. Take care of yourself.